Sponsored by Brilliant. Get smarter every day and save 20%. Link in the description. 265 videos, 21 million views, and now over 125,000 subscribers. Thanks again to all of you for your ongoing support. I'm Rene Ritchie, and this is Vector. Oh yeah, it's that time of year again. Apple's annual iPhone event is only a couple of weeks away. We've had a ton of leaks, a ton of spoilers, a bunch of renders on Twitter and graphs in business pubs, but Apple hasn't announced the iPhone 11 yet. Tim Cook hasn't shown it off on stage. Phil Schiller hasn't gone over all of its features in slides. And we already have some people tripping all over themselves to tell you how boring and must skippable it's just gotta be. And while I'm gonna focus on Apple and the upcoming iPhone 11 Pro for this, please feel absolutely free to extrapolate it out to the just announced Galaxy Note 10 and still pending Google Pixel 4 as well. Now I'm gonna break this down into two parts, the phones and the market. First, the phones. Since the original iPhone, iPhone 3G, and iPhone 3GS, Apple's been working on a four-year cycle. A major design change and then several years of refinement and mostly internal iteration. You could break the 4 and 4S and 5 and 5S apart if you really want to, but they're really very similar platforms, squared off designs, retina displays, custom processors, and better cameras. Then came the iPhone 6, 6S, 7, and 8, and all of their plus sizes all curved designs, bigger LCD displays, escalating processors, and even better cameras, especially starting with the 7 Plus. Now we're fully in the age of iPhone 10, edge to mostly edge designs, OLED displays, neural engine processors, and even better cameras. Wait for it, just wait, especially starting with the iPhone 11 Pro. Ignore all the noise and the click thirst. The absolute best way to think about the iPhone 11 Pro is to think back to the iPhone 7, specifically the iPhone 7 Plus. Two years after a terrifically successful new design, Apple kept the same design for a third year in a row, but gave it some cool new finishes and, more importantly, a significantly better camera system. Their first dual camera system with optical zoom and computational depth effects. Apple's always been pretty good about shipping feature sets, not chipsets. They didn't just throw NFC radios into the iPhone 6, they introduced Apple Pay. And they didn't just cram a telephoto camera into the iPhone 7 Plus, they introduced optical zoom and portrait mode. This year, rumors of cool new frosted finishes aside, the big rumor is a third camera. And sure, that's been done before, but often without any consideration for the consistency or color science or overall experience. With Apple, it's safe to bet their imaging pipeline, which they've built up from the sensor to the custom storage controller to the individually calibrated screens, will just handle it. And we'll get optical zoom out the way we've had optical zoom in, and the ability to do computational frame effects the way we've been able to do computational depth effects since the iPhone 7 Plus. Mark Gurman and Debbie Wu of Bloomberg have been reporting that all three cameras will fire all at the same time, and machine learning will let you correct composition if, for example, you accidentally cut part of a person out of a shot or didn't exactly center the subject the way you wanted to which is something I've had to deal with even on this channel. When I'm offside and can't center myself up without exposing the edge of the frame or zooming in, losing data and making my head look even goofier than it is already. Also, I'm guessing, thanks to the bigger sensors, that the photos will be much higher resolution, rivaling traditional cameras and have better low light, which Apple absolutely needs to keep up with Google and Huawei and the already industry-leading video camera capabilities will get boosted as well, getting many of the same features as the stills and in real time. Okay, so I can already feel a lot of you hitting the comments and saying, yeah, but how ugly that giant module housing it all is. And you know what? You're absolutely right. It's hideously, freakishly ugly, like an alien face hugger latched onto your phone ugly. Other companies are putting them in straight horizontal or vertical lines, which may or may not be more subjectively pleasing to you. Yet other companies are taking a page out of the Nokia Lumia 1020 and putting it dead center. Don't even ask me what Nokia is doing with all this. But Apple wants all three cameras equidistant to enable its new features and has other stuff like true depth sensors in the middle. So this is how they're fitting it all in. 
And as camera phones increasingly become phone cameras, the gross are only going to grow, at least until the next big imaging revolution. Now, the iPhone 7 had Apple's first efficiency dot performance fusion processor with the A10. The iPhone 11 is supposedly going to have Apple's first AMX or matrix processor for computer vision and augmented reality. The iPhone 7 was Apple's first officially water resistant model. The iPhone 11 will supposedly be dramatically more water resistant beyond even the current 30 minute rating and shatter resistant. Take that built in obsolescence sensors. The iPhone 7 had a virtualized home button and that's where I have to stop stretching this already beyond torn metaphor. But the iPhone 11, while not having a virtualized notch, will supposedly have a much better multi-angle face ID system that'll unlock earlier, faster, and from a much wider variety of angles, including while lying flat on the table. Add to that rumors of reverse inductive charging so you can top up compatible AirPods by placing them on top of the phone. And as Apre S years go, this one is shaping up to be the most compelling since, well, the last one, the iPhone 7, and maybe even much more than that. And while pundits just love to tell us how boring iterative and skippable S years are. When I asked all of you to tell me your favorite iPhones, the S years won like gangbusters, like six out of seven rounds, not even close. 5S was second, 4S third, 7 plus fourth, 6S fifth, 3GS sixth. So yeah, there's that fundamental disconnect between coverage and customers again. Which brings me to second, the market. Apple made a mistake last year. When they originally experimented with testing the upper feature and price limits of the iPhone, they didn't do it by making the iPhone more expensive. They did it by making more expensive iPhones. Let me explain. The iPhone 5S was succeeded by the iPhone 6, but on top of the iPhone 6, Apple added a more expensive iPhone as well, the iPhone 6 Plus. Slowly, over the next couple of years, Apple added features and expense to the Plus models, like that second camera and extra score of dollars, and we largely rewarded them for it. We made the more expensive iPhones the best sellers. Even when Apple introduced the iPhone 10 in 2017, they did it on top of the also new iPhone 8 and iPhone 8 Plus. In other words, the more expensive model was still marketed on top of what people considered the standard model. It was never marketed as the standard model. Those expectations were never upset until the iPhone XS and iPhone XS Max. Apple had tried marketing less expensive iPhones before, but we didn't buy it. Again, we told Apple what we wanted was more expensive iPhones, not a less expensive one. Last year though, with the thousand dollar iPhone XS poised to become the new normal, Apple tried undercutting it again, this time with the just as colorful but differently compromised iPhone XR. And while yes, They'd named themselves into a corner and the iPhone XR ended up being super popular and the market as a whole was approaching saturation. Expectations still ended up being upset. The XS was seen as the new normal and the XR as something underneath it and some customers felt like they were being priced out. That margins were down from their 2012 peaks, that sales were largely flat overall, that were keeping phones longer, making the amortized cost better. None of the actual financial analysis mattered. The narrative was that phones in general and iPhones in particular had become simply too expensive. Enter the iPhone Pro. You know, I saw a few people wonder out loud why Samsung called the latest Galaxy Notes the Note 10 and Note 10 Plus instead of making the Plus the regular Note 10 and positioning the smaller one as the Note 10e beneath it, like the S10e was positioned beneath the regular S10. And credit where it's due, I think Samsung was super smart the way they did it. Same with Huawei and the P versus P Pro, Mate versus Mate Pro. People like to feel things fit their budget, not that they're fitting in budget things, that they're getting stuff for less, not that they're getting less stuff. It might sound like nuance, but nuance matters. Getting a Note 10 feels better than getting a Note 10e, and not getting an extravagant plus feels better than not being able to get what should be normal. Apple knows this better than just about anyone. They made a big iPhone 6 and a bigger iPhone 6 Plus, not a bigger iPhone 6 and a smaller iPhone 6 Minus. But when Apple went from the iPhone 8, iPhone 8 Plus, and iPhone 10 to the iPhone 10R, iPhone 10s, and iPhone 10s Max, something flipped. 
intentionally or not, the iPhone XS, maybe because it came out first, maybe because S was familiar and R was new, maybe whatever, something flipped. And all of a sudden, the more expensive iPhone XS on top became perceived as the new expensive normal and the less expensive iPhone XR as something beneath it. Instead of you can get an iPhone for 750 bucks, or if you really want to, a souped up iPhone for $1,000 became an iPhone costs $1,000, but you can get a cheaper one for 750 if you're willing to give up some stuff. And nuance matters. Apple, of course, never had this problem with the Mac. They just had the MacBook or MacBook Air and on top of it, the MacBook Pro. Not with iPads either, where they had the iPad or iPad Air and then added on top of it, the iPad Pro. So. Now, it sounds like Apple is going to the past to fix the present, and instead of iPhone 11 R, iPhone 11, and iPhone 11 Max, which would create the same negative perception, they'll have the iPhone 11, iPhone 11 Pro, and iPhone 11 Max. The ever canny John Prosser has been saying for a while now that the market doesn't need innovation, it needs compromise. What I think it needs most though is maturity, not in terms of penetration, that's happened, but in terms of segmentation, which always has to follow. A long time ago, a fellow by the name of Steve Jobs grew a grid and labeled it desktop and notebook, consumer and professional. Things got more complicated after that, but really they didn't. Mobile is mature now and Apple is going back to the grid, phone and tablet, consumer and professional, MacBook and MacBook Pro, iMac and Mac Pro, iPad and iPad Pro, iPhone and iPhone Pro. Things are more complicated than that, but really they aren't. So according to rumors, the new Pro iPhone 11 will have triple cameras, steel and OLED parts, and a much more proper, by which I mean restricted, set of new finishes. The new consumer iPhone 11, by which I mean just the iPhone 11, will have dual cameras, a truly obscene chipset, long battery life, and a bunch of fun colors. And it'll cost much closer to what iPhones have always cost, what people expect them to cost. Especially if Apple does what I've been hoping they do for a while now, and that is toss up a slide that explains not just the cost, but the value prop beyond the cost. Getting an iPhone 11 will feel better than getting an iPhone 11 R, and not getting an extravagant iPhone 11 Pro will feel better than not being able to get what should be just the normal iPhone 11. And things might just flip back, at least for customers, if not coverage. Even if people are keeping iPhones longer, if Apple is making them last longer, if trade-ins and aftermarket resales means you don't have to pay anywhere near full price anyway, even if every blogger, podcaster, and YouTuber is rubbing their hands with glee, just getting ready to shout out to you about the iPhone 11 not being a compelling upgrade for iPhone XS owners, despite Apple intending the iPhone 11 for people still on the iPhone 6S or iPhone 7 for whom it would be a great upgrade and no, stop. Never mind. That's a problem to be solved another day in another video, which is just exactly why I have Brilliant. It's a problem solving website and app with over 50 interactive courses. In Brilliant's new puzzle science course, you'll develop a solid foundation in physics while playing with puzzles. Each quiz focuses on solving puzzles that relate to a topic in the natural world. You'll explore the physics of mirror reflections, laser tag, and making the perfect shot in a game of pool. There's even a whole series where you'll use puzzles to figure out why steel ships don't sink in the ocean, but steel blocks do. Effective learning is about problem solving and Brilliant will help you learn and get practice. You'll come away better at problem solving. To support Vector and get unlimited access to Brilliant's courses and daily challenges, head on over to brilliant.org slash vector and get 20% off their annual premium subscription. Thanks Brilliant and thanks to all of you, seriously, for supporting the show. I'm basing all of this all on my years of experience in the industry. It's what I think. But now I'd love to hear what you think. Hit like if you do, hit subscribe and AMX that bell gizmo so YouTube will let you know when the next video goes live and then hit up the comments and let me know. Thank you for watching and see you next video.